Hi, um, my name is Eric. I'm with Solana. Uh, I want to today just give a brief overview of what we are, a little bit about the tech, and then a little bit about our community, and then where we are going next. There we go. Um, so here's the, the basics. Uh, so we're a layer one blockchain protocol. Our thing is we don't do any sharding, no side chains. Uh, if you've heard anything about Solana, you've probably heard the term proof of history. Uh, I'll get into the details of this. The idea is you build time into the blockchain data structure itself. Uh, we are a proof of stake protocol. Um, our, one of our major goals here is to remove the blockchain propagation bottleneck from the consensus layer to the hardware layer. And for us, that means GPUs and bandwidth. The point here is, think how cool it would be if uh, you know, these, these things, GPU and hardware, are expected to double every couple years. How awesome would it be if your blockchain throughput is scaling along with that? Core team's out of, uh, mostly out of Qualcomm, and uh, we are open source since the beginning. Um, if I have, say any like, wackadoodle TPS numbers, you know, feel free not to believe me. I mean, Please believe me, but uh, feel free to check it for yourself, too. So uh, I think everyone knows there's, um, there's problems with consensus or with scaling in general. Consensus is slow, leading to uh, low throughput. This has been known for a long time. It's papers from 1978, Leslie Lamport, just m making the point that in any distributed system, blockchain or regardless, if you have different entities that have to agree on, say, the, the state of a system, uh, they're gonna need to know the ordering of the transaction or the processes to get to the same endpoint. The solution is a clock, right? It's kind of straightforward. If you've, those entities share a clock, they can all come, come to the same agreement. And so, historically, this is done like this. You just set up a clock, and you tell all your, your nodes to look to that clock, and that's, traditionally been atomic clocks and data centers or radio signal or you know a quartz crystal on your phone etc but the problem of course in permissionless blockchain systems you can't do this because um, it's a very centralized approach and so one of the you know really innovative things about Bitcoin of course is that proof of work is a clock yeah. uh, Satoshi's white paper says to implement a distributed timestamp server you got to use proof of work and it's brilliant, right? Every 10 minutes, this clock ticks. Um, along with that ticking of the clock, you have consensus and the blockchain progresses, right? So that's what I mean when, when I say time is tied with consensus. In proof of stake, it's a little bit more complicated, um, but the general idea is that uh, for me as a proof of stake node to agree with all my proof of stake node buddies about the time and the ordering and when they saw things and how they should arrange it, I gotta kinda talk to them. I gotta ask all my proof of stake buddies, well, when did you see this, when did you see that? Maybe take a median timestamp um, and then progress. The idea there is it, it takes a lot of communication. Over it. You're kinda pinging a lot of, sending a lot of messages to figure that out and that is consensus, right? You're all coming to agreement before you can move forward. So again, consensus or, sorry, progress is tied to that consensus step. And you can imagine in this scenario, the more nodes you have, the longer this is gonna take, the slower your blockchain will progress. And so Solana, in a very cartoony way, is kinda like this. This is what we're talking about when we talk about proof of history, it's a cryptographically verifiable clock that runs on each node um, we, that provides that sense of time and ordering before consensus. So me as, a, as a, a node, I'm gonna receive this proof of history and I can trust the time and ordering of the transactions without having to worry about my node buddies. Consensus comes later, so I can plow forward with state processing and then layer on consensus after trusting that and verifying that everyone else is basically on the same page as far as, uh, as, far as their proof of history. So I guess if we look at proof of history, uh, like how it actually works, first I just wanna call out it's a not a consensus mechanism, it's got the unfortunate proof of in front of it, which 
I think is pretty misleading. We are proof of stake, but proof of history is really the data structure itself. It's, it's, the, it's the blockchain. Um, I guess in one sentence, the idea is that it uses a serialized verifiable delay function, again, to build time into the data structure. So what is a de verifiable delay function? It's a function that takes a fixed amount of time to execute and you can verify the execution in less time than it takes to, to, um, to generate it. So for us, the function we use is a SHA-256. You take the output of that and you put it into SHA-256 and you take the output and you put it into SHA-256 and you have a recursive loop of hashes. So if you just saw that, it would just be hash, 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 hash. Um, what you can do with that is because that SHA-256 has a fixed time to execute, looking at this hash chain, you know that real time elapsed to generate it. You can also divide it up, send it to different GPU cores to, to verify. So the, the time that it takes to verify is gonna be a fraction of the time it takes to generate. So it satisfies this, um, the uh, VDF constraints. So it might look like this. If time is moving from top to bottom, you have this SHA-256 recursive loop. Your data structure might look like that on the right. You know, that is proof of history. It's a hash and a counter. Then if you start seeing transactions in your blockchain, what you can do is just take that transaction, hash it into this proof of history. And that once you do that, all subsequent hashes are going to be changed. It's gonna give a unique signature of the chain. You have another transaction, same idea, and the hashes in between those two transactions can be verified that they took real time to execute so you know the order. So maybe, a, you know, an um, analogy might be if you take a photo of yourself with the New York Times, you kind of have proof that you existed up until that point. And then if somehow you can get that published in the New York Times at a later date, you've bound that event in time. And so you can kind of think of the proof of history in that sense. Here, time is going from left to right. This is just kind of the, the hash chain going on. And what we're showing here is just that you can take this hash chain, divide it up by the number of cores that you have. Your modern GPU is about 4,000. And so you can verify if you've generated, if you've been running this, this recursive loop for one second, you can split that up over 4,000 cores and verify it in about a quarter of a microsecond. So why is this cool? Um, here's one example. This is what you're looking at, again, is from left to right. This is the, the proof of history, and we're looking at those transactions as votes. Uh, going on to the chain. Uh, so we, we, we like to uh, talk about if you're on an isolated desert island and somehow you see a bottle with a USB key in it and for some reason you have a computer on this island and you can open it up and you see this data structure, you can reconstruct the, the state of the chain completely independently. And so one of the things you might want to ask if instead of a stranded person on an island, you're a stranded node on this network, is who's actually involved in this network? What's the active set? And so from strictly looking at this proof of history stream, you're able to um, reconstruct the active set by looking at the votes and trusting the order of those votes. And so if it's understood that you're defining the active set as all votes in the last 10 minutes, for example, you'd see, well, Alice voted quite a while ago, she's out of the active set, and then you can reconstruct who's in it, and then you can pick up and go from there. So given this, that we can, time can be verified to, uh, that the ledger itself took real time to generate, it's very hard to uh, falsify this ledger, or at least you have to take as equal or more amount of time. Okay, so that's kind of proof of history. If we go really kind of quickly into how, how that fits into the bigger picture of, of a network, we basically have a rotating leader system. So on the, on the left, you have four validators or four nodes in the system. Because we have a sense of time, what you can do is assign time slots for each, each node. 
Um, it's kind of like the the conch in um, in what's that? It's a story with Piggy and Lord of the Flies. Yeah, whoever has the conch can talk, and so you're kind of passing the conch uh, according to your own internal clock on your node. And so in this case, Alice owns slot one, which means it's her turn to start processing the transactions, hashing them into the proof of history, and then broadcasting them out. After, in, on the slide, after, you know, for example, 3,000 hashes later, it's Bob's, then Charlie's, then Dan's, and so on. This is how, um, I, this goes back to like, a, you know, how uh, uh, communications used to ha happen over analog radio channels. You know, if everyone's stuck in the same time, you get a lot of noise, but if you divide it up with a clock, you can, uh, you can all talk and actually communicate. Okay, so now that we have that, we know when leaders are kind of chosen and, and sending these messages. Now, if we're nodes in that network, we want to receive those messages and then we want to vote on them. Uh, this is kind of walking through how we think about consensus and how we think about voting on a certain branch or a certain fork of the proof of history as a, as a node. So again, we have Alice on the, on the left here. She, for each slot, she's gonna cast a vote um, based on the data she receives uh, to uh, ensure that she is uh, kind of placing a bet on the fork that she thinks is the right one each vote comes out with comes with a lockout. And what a lockout means is if I'm Alice and I'm voting on this version of the ledger, I cannot vote on another version of that ledger for a given amount of time without potentially getting slashed. So the interesting thing about this structure is that for each vote she plays, so here in slot one, she places a, a vote on the fork one she has a lockout until slot two, so she can't vote on another fork to slot two. Slot two, she votes. That vote actually doubles her lockout from slot one and from slot two. So it exponentially grows her lockout each time. So th slot three, now her, her lockout from slot two has extended e even further. So the more you vote on a given version, the, longer, the more you're committed to it. Again, um, that restricts you from voting on an alternate fork unless uh, without the risk of splashing. Once, once she, she's voted enough time on a certain fork, the, um, she's, she'll reach match, kind of max lockout on her original vote, and that will lock her into that fork, and then it will also deliver rewards for that fork. Okay, so bear, with, bear with me on this. This is uh, trying to show how a network partition, given this consensus structure might resolve itself. And so I guess the thing to look out for here is we got five validators on the left, two partitions, Alice and Bob are in one, Charlie, Dan, and Eve are in another. Uh, and then as we click through, you'll see Alice is gonna broadcast in slot one, then Bob in slot two, and you'll see how the network responds to the data that's being propagated. So for slot one, Alice is broadcasting her data, the transactions, Bob sees it because he's in the same partition, so Bob votes on it. He's got no reason not to. But Charlie, Dan, and Eve don't see anything because they're, they're partitioned. Next slot, now Bob is broadcasting. Alice sees it because, again, same partition, so they both vote on it. Charlie, Dan, and Eve still don't see anything. So you see Alice and Bob now have lockouts um, that extend to slot four. This time, Charlie, it's his turn to vote, so he's got the conch. The thing is, he's in a different partition. So only Dan and Eve see his data. Alice and Bob have no data to vote on. And then this is where it gets interesting. It's Dan's turn, he broadcasts. The partition has ended, so the network is back together. Alice and Bob see the data, because they, they're back in contact with Dan, but they can't vote on it because they've already committed to a different fork. They've already, they, their lockout extends past slot four, so they have nothing to do. One more step, Eve transmits, again, everybody sees it. Alice and Bob see it, they know it's on a different fork, but their lockout has expired, so they can vote on it. 
they've got nothing else to vote on, right? And they're, they've waited long enough, and so that's called a rollback. They vote on slot five, the network is, is all happy back together again, and then it progresses. Okay, <laughs> so that was, that was kind of a quick, quick and dirty run through of proof of history, how we propagate blocks and consensus. Um, and so I'll talk about like the, the difficult part now, which is community, um, and how we kind of think about community and go about building community. Um, I think the two, two major players that were, are top of mind right now are validators and developers. You know, validators, of course, are, are kind of the, the lifeblood of proof of stake networks. I think everyone was uh, pretty inspired, at least we were really inspired by Cosmos's incentivized testnet game of stakes. So we are kind of in the, uh, currently running our own called Tour de Soul. Uh, you know, I, I think we're just really excited to have a really um, a talented group of validators that have helped us so far. Uh, the idea here is that we're going to run our incentivized testnet in stages, each stage kind of focus on a different aspect of performance of the network. And the goal is, you know, kind of kicking the tires, stress testing the network, of course, letting the validators contribute and kind of show us, show everybody their, uh, what they got and demonstrate their value. And then of course, reward early participation and support from the network um, as we head towards mainnet. So we have a good amount registered um, and a good amount confirmed too. We're hoping to kick off this month. We're kind of uh, most of the way through our, we're calling them dry runs, uh, run up to the, to the launch of Tour de Soul. So for developers, I wanted to briefly just go over an idea we've been kicking around for the last couple weeks. It's funny, I think uh, we did not uh, independently come up with this. It's come up in a lot of conversations. It seems like it's an idea that's bubbling up uh, across the community, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, the idea is, you know, some sort of, for us at least, a developer grants program a way to align developers with the network itself. And we thought it'd be cool if we could do that by partnering them with validators, because they're both such core you know, communities. And so the, the you know, rough beats of this is that developers and validators kind of partner up together. You can kind of think of it as maybe even a validator sponsorship of a developer. And so this would be the situation where a developer maybe has an idea of, like, I want to build a DEX. They, they find a validator to partner up with they come and they say, hey, we want to do this together. Solana Foundation says, cool, that sounds great. Um, here's, a, here's kind of our, uh, our grant. We'll give it to you as a delegation to the validator. And so in, in proof of state network, this validator is going to receive this delegation, start validating, start earning rewards. Those rewards would go to the developer that they've partnered with to fund the the work that they're doing over time. I think it would also be interesting if you could, if we, you know, you can imagine maybe a situation where you've set up some outcomes or some milestones and you might imagine that delegation vesting into ownership of those two parties over time as well. And I think this, this kind of relationship, oops, really aligns a lot of incentives in the right way. And there's, I think, a lot of details to work out, but that's kind of where we're, our head's at right now with it. So where are we? Progress. Um, I think it's safe to say the core computer science innovations have been, uh, been validated. And so that would be proof of history. It might also be some of the block propagation uh, techniques. And so in some sense, you could say it's maybe downhill from here. Um, maybe it's only slightly downhill. And it's like an arduous path with, with dangerous animals on it. Um, but really, it's blood, sweat, and tears from here. It's just kind of executing and optimizing. Um, but I think we're over the, the white paper phase. <laughs> we're definitely over the white paper phase. We have a, white, a live testnet. You can deploy code in C, Rust, and Move, Validator API. Here's some, uh, some numbers. I think with all TPS numbers, it's totally context dependent. And there's you know, a lot that goes behind each, each number. You know, um, like I said earlier, we're pretty confident about high throughput in general. So I would, I would encourage, if you're interested, come ask me about those or just follow along. I think our Tour de Soul is going to be um, 
pretty interesting just to, to demonstrate what we can do in a, in a real world environment. Maybe the one thing I'll point out is we, we were able to port Move, um, I guess quicker than Facebook was. Um, they, they claimed to hope to launch with 1,000 TPS sometime next year, pending that they launch at all, I guess. And uh, we were able to run it with 3,200 3, TPS pretty much out, out of the box. So again, we are uh, running Tour de Sol this month. Uh, hopefully, it will kick off. Mainnet this, uh, this quarter, we're thinking a slow kind of phase mainnet launch. And this, I think, is just the kind of responsible thing to do, uh, enabling transfers and smart contracts and further functionality probably uh, early next year. If you're interested in learning more, uh, either go there or find us on Discord, bug us. We're happy to answer any questions. Uh, feel free to download our code and, uh, and help us out. Thanks.